Good evening. Tonight's show is very interesting regarding sports injuries, sports-related injuries, and common orthopedic injuries. Stay tuned. Good evening. Tonight's guest is Dr. John Gibbons. He's a board-certified orthopedic surgeon. We are taking your calls live. If you want to call in tonight, please feel free to do so. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Gene. It's my pleasure to be here. Excellent. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, orthopedic surgery, uh, how you got to where you were. Well, or are. yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and orthopedics is a treatment of bone and joint disorders, and, uh, and I do have a focus in, uh, in both sports medicine and, and joint replacement, and sports medicine is the treatment of athletes, whether it's recreational athletes or competitive athletes, whether they're on the elite competitive level or simply on a weekend type of athlete. Um, we, we see a lot of injuries in sports, and Part of sports medicine is trying to help prevent the injuries and also help treat them once they are injured. Perfect. Uh, I know that your um, practice with Dr. Mutchler uh, and team uh, encompasses a lot of local high school and I believe some local college athletics. Um, if anybody would like to call in regarding that or even uh, us middle-aged guys that are trying to get in shape for the end of the year, um, please feel free to do so. Let's, let's talk more commonly, what's one of the more common injuries? Would it be knee injuries? Well, it, it partly depends on what kind of sport and activities that you're okay. in, and also the, the age of the athlete. Um, when you're when you're dealing with the high school athletes, then um, it, it a lot depends on the sport, whether they're in a contact sport or whether they're in one that has a lot of repetitive motion or overuse type injuries. The, the younger kids can be susceptible to overuse injuries as, as well as the older athletes. And, and part of it depends on, on um, the actual events leading up to the injury. Okay, well, we've gone through pretty much football season. Certainly it's ended uh, yeah, locally. Yeah, yeah. Football, football is, uh, as you know, it's a contact sport. So you see lots of, of injuries from direct collision uh, like other sports such as soccer, often you see uh, non-contact injuries, you see a lot of knee injuries such as ACL tears. And you can see them in football too when someone, another player rolls into, uh, into an a athlete's knee, then, then that can be common. But you can injure pretty much any part of the body in football, you know, okay. all the way from concussions, shoulder injuries, back injuries, ankle injuries. Okay, well, it's basketball season. What are one of the more common basketball injuries? Well, the, the thing that you worry about basketball, I mean, the, the, probably the, the most common is um, uh, knee injuries and, and ankle injuries. Okay. Th those are the two most common. Uh, you worry about um, ACL injuries in the knee. That, that's, the, okay. uh, that, that's the big worry because at most competitive athletes will need surgery if they do have an ACL injury. They'll okay. have to undergo an ACL it's reconstruction. One of my favorite announcers of all time, Howard Cosell, used to say, it's always the knee. Yeah. It's yeah. always the knee. Yeah. Yeah. Just well, like that, true. too. Yeah. Yeah. How about this new guy, Tony Kornheiser? You think he's any good? Well, I, I don't really. I, I don't watch football. Well, I, I do watch him and stuff, but he's Monday you know, night football is on yes, tonight. I know, I know, I know. I think he game, tries to I, be too much like Howard yeah. Cosell. He had to be try to be more like Tony Corner. That's right. That's right. I used to watch him on his. Somebody's uh, out there and knows how to use that email thing. Could maybe out of email on it. Yeah. <laughs> Always the knee. Why yeah. is it? Is it because it's uh, more exposed, more of a hinge joint? Uh, well, it, it is exposed. That? I mean, in in. Um, the knee was really big in football because other players used to hit hit the the players below the the waist, like hit below the knee. Yeah. Uh, they changed the rules many years ago to try to help protect athletes because the the football players would get the the chop block or the crack back and hit them hit them below the knees, and they'd ruin a 
player's career and knock them out for the, the rest of their life. And so they change a lot of the rules, so you don't see them that often. But still, you can see that, that football injury when someone rolls into it. it it's actually kind of interesting that, um, that in some, some uh, colleges that they have all their, their uh, linemen wear knee braces and trying to protect protect it. It's okay. arguable how much that would help out, but but the, the idea is trying to help prevent those injuries where uh, another player rolls into it. But what's also kind of funny is that now the, the vast majority of ACL injuries are actually from non-contact, uh, that they, you, you stop quickly mm -hmm. or off balance or the way you land and then you feel um, a, a pop in your knee and then you'll okay. tear your ACL. ACL's anterior cruciate ligament? Yes. Okay. Anterior cruciate ligament, and that provides stability to the knee. It prevents the tibia, which is the shin bone, from going in forward in relationship to the femur, or, or it, that's the check rein to keep okay. it from going. So if you had sudden force where the, the tibia is going forward too quickly, then that's usually the mechanism of, okay. of making the ACL tear. Um, and how would you make that diagnosis besides a physical examination? Are there other easy ways to make a diagnosis? Well, the, the best way is actually the... the uh, physical examination, um, also the history that often the, the athletes will describe, suddenly get a popping in the knee and having the instability. And the best exam is actually the first one early on before okay. there's too much swelling. But there are certain tests that are, are um, specific for, or not specific, but there are tests that are, are good for knee injuries in general, and that's the, the MRI, uh, the magnetic resonance imaging. And okay. that, um, that shows the soft tissue around the knee. It's very good at diagnosing ACL tears, but often you can tell it just on uh, history and physical exam. Okay, and when you get this uh, type of injury, um, you do an MRI, what's the next step after that? Well, after you do the, the history, the physical exam, you do the MRI, then you have to talk about the treatment options. The, um, the, the, um, Essentially, you have to decide whether you're going to treat it operatively or non-operatively. Initially, most most people have to work on getting their range of motion because it's very inflamed and sore okay. early on. So they often do physical therapy and, and getting a range of motion. Now we're talking and specifically for ACL or for any knee injury. Well, I mean, all, you can. I, I've been talking specifically for ACLs, okay. but almost any injury just, just you so initially, yeah, the. The initially is trying to get your range of motion back so that okay. you can get try to cut down the swelling, uh, minimize the pain, try to get the knee moving to get okay. as much range of motion as possible. Then you have to decide whether you're going to need surgery as, as one of the treatment options. So with the anterior cruciate ligament injury, the um, uh, the the ligament will not heal by itself. Right, the, and so if you you will either be without uh, anterior cruciate ligament, where some people can manage. Say, for okay. instance, if I if I tore my ACL now, right. I'm uh, in my 40s, so I, I possibly could get by without having okay. a, a, a ACL. I could have an ACL deficient knee, but right. still be able to do many of the activities that I do. You know, play around with the kids and, okay. and such. What I have to give you strokes at golf? Yeah, I mean, that would really yeah. be where I would. Well, golf, I, I probably well. I have such a terrible game that okay. it, it wouldn't hurt it at all. But you, you could, most people can golf even though okay. if the ACL is torn. <clears throat> but if you're getting back to playing basketball, soccer, any sort okay. of competitive sports. Where you had to stop and start? Stop, exactly. The okay. sudden change of direction, then that's the one that you need an anterior cruciate ligament. That's where you okay. will notice it. Not that anyone would ever confuse you for a middle-aged woman, but if you were and had a middle-aged woman with an ACL tear, uh, would they be able to exercise? I mean, uh, women. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And then <clears throat> as you get as you get kind older, of kind that's of right. Thing, if you're not if you're not playing the, the the sudden stop and go okay. type of sports, then you actually can rehab your knee and get back to most of the uh, athletic activities, jogging, um, uh, exercise like lifting weights, okay. things like that. No um, problem. But as you start to get a little bit more competitive, such as you're, you're playing tennis and you're right. in, you know, if you're playing doubles tennis, it's probably right. not as bad. But if you're playing singles tennis or if you want to compete singles yeah. tennis or play aggressively, right. then you may have a problem with it. Um, most of the people, when they get a knee injury, is it by the history alone, is it pretty much they can tell you know that there's been a problem? Yeah, usually you, you gather a lot of information from the okay. history. They can describe it. 
and that <laughs> together with the physical examination is by far the best uh, right. the, the best way to diagnose uh, the other testing such as MRI or x-rays right. actually complement the exam yeah so yeah. the insurance company doesn't think you're scamming them or something like <laughs> that well I'd love to have an insurance if anyone's ever watching please come on a show I'd love to have a nice talk with you um, or malpractice plaintiffs attorneys, we'd love to talk to you. Defense plaintiffs, that'd be fine. Come on the show, we'll be happy to talk to you too. Um, when you talk specifically about knee injuries, a um, hundred years ago when I was in college, just, just a little older than these young high school athletes running around here, I played college competitive tennis. And in my 30s, uh, I suffered a knee injury playing tennis. Mm -hmm. And I tore out a lateral meniscus. And I can honestly tell you, if you've never done that, you have, there's no question in your mind that you have a major knee injury when you do that because it felt like somebody stuck a knife right through my knee and I dropped like I got shot. Uh -huh. there yeah. was, and I felt a big pop, like a big rubber band pop. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so it's, it wasn't very subtle. It wasn't like, I wonder if I hurt my knee. Uh -huh. And yeah. so if you're out there, this is the guy to see. He's a phenomenal guy uh, with uh, these types of injuries. Uh, young, old, middle-aged. Uh, this was before you came to town about 100 years ago. Um, and so you do surgery on people, do That's the right. scope. That's you right. Yeah, yeah. Mo most surgeries around the knee can be done uh, through very minimally invasive techniques. You're doing um, uh, arthroscopic surgery where it requires two small incisions or, or maybe sometimes you have to do a few more than that coming in the knee at different angles and directions but it's done through a camera that's about the size of a, of a pen mm -hmm. and you place it in the in the knee and then um, and then we we uh, project the, the image on a, on a monitor and then we can do surgery such as it's almost like playing a video game and you can um, uh, and you can take care of most cartilage tears and uh, the um, and then the the ligament reconstructions take a little bit more but again it's done through very small incisions right. The, it's really only when you start talking about the the knee replacement and the bigger operations like that that you have to make the big cuts. Okay. When you um, have these uh, meniscal injuries, are most of them just treated with uh, removal of the meniscus, or can you sometimes repair it, or is it young versus old? Or yeah, yeah, and, and that's a good question. They um, they most, pay me to ask the yeah. questions. <laughs> Yeah, mo most cartilage tear. The meniscus is cartilage, and uh, most of the time with the meniscus tears, you, you just have to trim them and you smooth them off. But for um, the young athlete, uh, uh, then often we try to repair them or sew them back together again. They have to be in the area of the meniscus where it has good blood supply, so it's mostly towards the outer rim. The younger the the person is, the the um, and the location of the tear will help decide the, whether we're going to try to repair them. If we can, we, we do repair them because okay. ideally you want to keep all of your cartilage can if you can. Can you repair can. it through the scope? Yes, you repair it through the scope. Okay. Sometimes cool. you have to make a, a one cut that's a little bit bigger, um, but most of the time you can repair it through the scope. That's perfect. Um, let's talk a little bit about ankle injuries. I think that um, do you get more ankle injuries with basketball than opposed to knee or well, 50, 50 yeah, girls, men. yeah. Any kind of split on that? I, I don't know, actually, to say more. I mean, you see a lot of ankle sprains. Um, okay. That's very, very common in basketball, and some people are more predisposed to ankle sprains. And once you get one, then it seems like you get more and more of them. Uh, Anything you, know, you can the, do to prevent it? Any kind yes, of you, activity? Well, yeah, actually, um, if if you uh, if you do have one ankle sprain, then I. I I think therapy is very, very helpful in trying to help strengthen the muscles around the ankle in order to prevent it. There's a lot that you can do with um, proprioception, and, and what that means is getting a sense of where your joint is or where your body is at any one one uh, time. So, for instance, when you're landing and you're, you're going to be off balance a little bit, your body can sense it and help correct it. Right. And you can work on that with therapists. They do things like balance boards. They do um, uh, where you, you try to work on your balance and, and jumping and landing and mm -hmm. just trying to um, uh, get better muscle control in order okay. to prevent it. You can also use braces and um, there are ankle supports that you can buy over the counter or you okay. can get some through uh, your physician. 
and in addition, most of the the uh, most schools, as you start to get higher, up, like at right. the high school level, then there are trainers that tape right. ankles. Does that help tra taping the ankle? It, it does. It does. Okay. It helps to provide some support. I mean, ideally, you don't want to use that instead of strengthening your ankle. Right. The best the best option is, is strengthening it. Right. Exercising. Now, some, it. Yeah. Some and people, taping as a precaution. Right. Right. Okay. Some people who have had bad ankle sprains and have had. Uh, bad injuries and they end up with persistent ankle ankle instability okay. and sometimes they, they, they benefit from reconstruction of the ligaments in the ankle but fortunately okay. that's, the, that's only a small rare. percentage yeah right. yeah very small percentage of ankle injuries is um, if somebody's out there trying to figure out if their uh, young child young athlete has a fracture versus an ankle sprain is there any way to do it with that you know, the hefty cost of going to an emergency room and waiting precipitously for four hours and then getting an x-ray? Yeah. Well, un unfortunately, the only way to tell it, whether they have a fracture is with an x-ray. You can't yeah. tell on physical exam alone. Perfect. Sometimes you can be, you can suspect one way or the other, but really you need an x-ray. Now, yeah. um, I mean, one way is go through the emergency room or another way that often, like for instance, our office that we, we usually try to make uh, room for anybody who has uh, has an injury that they okay. try to get them in to get an x-ray um, as best as we can and try to right. keep them from having to wait oh, too that's long. That's great. So then they don't That's right. Perfect. Um, again, we're talking to Dr. John Gibbons, board certified orthopedic surgeon. If you'd like to call in tonight to ask specifically uh, any orthopedic questions would be ideal tonight since we do have an orthopedic surgeon here on yeah. board this evening. Yeah. And uh, Okay, so uh, are there any shoes that are better than any other shoes? I don't want to, you know, pump any brand, but I mean, are there uh, the high ankle ones better than the low? I mean, you know, do they, well, anything no, shown? In no, the, I mean, the, the important is to get good fitting shoes, okay. and also the, you want to get them from a, a respectable brand. As far as whether the um, the high top ankle supports are, are better than the other I mean that's that's very arguable but okay. you do want to get quality shoes you want to get them to fit well you want right. to make sure that they don't get worn down too much especially if you're doing distance mm -hmm. running type of uh, sports because as they get beat up then you can start getting overuse type injuries okay. and uh, so and most of the high school athletes uh, you know uh, I have two on the basketball team the girls basketball team and the, you know it's a team kind of a deal they all get their their shoes together, so yeah. they're all the same, which is yeah. nice matching shoes. Mm -hmm. But how about the guy that's out there, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving are coming up, and a few of us uh, won't uh, keep any of our uh, New Year's resolutions from last year, so we'll have to repeat the same. And then, you know, we'll get that little uh, extra poundage on right right <laughs> yeah. after uh, the holidays. And extra turkey. Right. And well, and you know, unfortunately, now I've, yeah. uh, I've been doing this for about 8,000 years, and so the my patients feel the need to bring me candy and I and cookies and food. And I feel the need to taste it all just to be certain that that's you know, right. They, that's you know. right. And we do have a rating system. If you'd like to drop some food off, we'll be happy to test it. Virtually <laughs> everybody gets an A plus uh, <laughs> and brings more, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, but then we get this uh, long run for a short slide to talk about um, a little bit extra weight. So now we want to lose it after the holidays. Yep. Number one resolution. Since I never smoked, I, you know, I can't say that. Mm -hmm. uh, although I've given that up for Lent many a time. I think mm -hmm. that's a very good one to give up for Lent. To keep that in mind for next year. Give up smoking for Lent. Especially if you don't do it, it's very easy. Um, any special shoes that uh, the non-athlete, and now I'm approaching middle age or almost there, may have arrived looking backwards. Uh, like you know, these cross training shoes, are they the ones we should be wearing? Well, I mean that, that's a, exactly. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Shoes have gotten it really so sounds good. Though, that's cross right. training. <laughs> shoes have gotten so high tech that uh, depending on the sports that you're playing, then you can get shoes that are specific for that. Uh, Is there a sport cross training? Now? I'm, I don't know what that means. <laughs> that's supposed to. Be, that's the Somebody all call purpose shoe. Somebody call Somebody's been working on sticks tonight. Yeah. yeah. Cross training is that? Yeah. But it's good if, you, if you're going to get back into... And wear it for uh, basketball and yeah. skydiving? I mean, really. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know. I just thought I'd bring that up. Yeah. One of the things I think about when I'm not doing yeah. anything else. Yeah. Well, if, if you are going to be running, like, distance or so, then, then you do want to get good quality shoe. You don't have to worry that. about that. With but that. if you're going to the gym and you're just lifting weights and exercising, then, then you, you just have to get something comfortable. Okay. So if you're yeah. a runner, 
running it's a shoes running a yeah running running shoes is very important okay. to have them fit well and to to make sure that you get the you get new ones when they start to wear down. That, I, mean, I yeah. probably can have the same. I mean, you can run into shin splints and all sorts of overuse type injuries. I can tell you about shin splints, and, yeah. but that's back when I was an athlete a million years ago. Yeah. Talk to us about shin splints. Who gets them? Well, I mean, they, they can occur to anybody, but they're, they're usually with um, athletes as they, they start to increase their activities. You see them a lot as the, the new season starts, like when yeah. cross-country season starts, when they start picking up their mileage, yeah. or they switch to a new sport from, like, basketball to track. Okay. Then uh, um, you know, what it is really is an overuse injury, and they start to get pain in the, in the tibia, and it can get... That's in the lower leg, yeah, right? In the lower right. leg, yep. Okay. Yeah, and it gets really sore and in, in, mm -hmm. in pain in the lower leg. You have to be careful because you can't totally ignore it because you can get a stress fracture, mm -hmm. and then that's a very difficult problem, and that can put somebody out for, for the season and even mm -hmm. longer. Um, we used to, when we were in college, we used to run about four miles a day on nice, nice, nice soft turf. Yep. And then I went to medical school in Philly and started trying to run the four miles a day on the asphalt streets of Philadelphia like Rocky. I could probably run a little faster than him at the time. But probably within about three months, I got shin splints. And it took virtually 18 months to yeah. stop running to get yeah. rid of that. Yeah, yeah. once you get it. So you're better off preventing it and, and, and just being, uh, being careful and listening to your body. Okay. Yeah. So you just can't push it. Yeah, I mean, it's different. You know, it's like that, that no pain, no gain doesn't always work. Okay. And then when you're doing things like distance running, if you start mm -hmm. to feel pain in, in the lower leg, then you've got to back off. Got it. Um, are any specific weight machines, we've got, we got the plethora of exercise places now, mm -hmm. uh, are any specific machines better than any other specific machines, free rates versus these uh, machines, and also... Are elliptical machines say better than treadmills versus you know stair masters or no, they each you, have their you, own place? Yeah, there? exactly. That, they each have their own place, and each one is is good and have its benefits um, specific to that. Now, the the real key is that you have to do it properly, and technique is very important. And that's why it's good if you're just starting off exercise, you haven't done it before, and you just want to start getting into the exercise regime, then it's important to work with a personal trainer or okay. somebody to show you how to properly work each of the machines or the free weights. Okay. Um, a lot of the heavy lifters like to get onto the, the free weights because they can concentrate on, on uh, focus on certain muscle groups okay. a little bit better than on some of the machines. The machines are, are fine though for, for most people when okay. they're um, exercising. As long as you do it properly, you you adjust the seats properly. As far as treadmill and elliptical, the elliptical machine is a little bit easier. on the, You don't have the pounding that you have on the mm -hmm. treadmill. So, um, uh, so it's a little bit gentler on the body. However, a lot of people feel that they don't get as much of a workout out of, say, the elliptical machine as they would out of the, uh, the treadmill or the Stairmaster. Stairmaster is very tough on, on joints. It's a hard it's a machine that you get a good workout from, right. but at the same time, so the stairmaster should be uh, reserved for the young people we have. Yeah, the yeah. I mean, camera it's, people this evening because they're all yeah, yeah, thin and fit yeah, and trim. Yeah, yeah. As the, the as uh, the patients or the athletes get a little bit older, then this, the okay. the stairmaster can start to cause some knee problems. Now, my population, probably the youngest people in my population, tend to be in their early seventies. It seems and 70s and 80s. Uh, is there anything we can do for the older, more mature seasoned citizen athlete? Can you give them a, a pearl of wisdom as far as you know what would be helpful to them, what exercises, how you can prevent injuries in, in the more seasoned citizen population? Well, I, I think it's very important that no matter what your age to be on some sort of exercise regime. It's good for your overall health, it's good for bone strength, it's good for um, uh, just quality of life issues. Now before you jump out and start uh, trying to exercise like like mad, then you, you have to make sure that you, you talk to your family physician uh, just to make sure that your, your heart is in adequate condition and, and if there's any medical issues that may interfere with with the exercising, but if that's okay, then, then it is good to start exercising. You want to do it in moderation to start up and slowly build up. Um, it's important to that you have adequate warm-up. You want to spend a few minutes at the beginning to 
to warm up before you do any real lifting. It's important to stretch because stretching is, is um, a uh, key, uh, both uh, stretching a little bit before and then also it's good to stretch after you exercise. And you want to combine both the um, uh, strengthening exercise as well as aerobic type exercise, something to okay. help with your cardiovascular <clears throat> system. Um, would it, does it help if you take a little Advil before or after they, uh, like a tablet of Advil? Yeah. It, or something it, like that? It can. If you take some anti-inflammatory, it can cut down on some of the muscle aches and such. Okay. Um, you, you have to be careful as you start taking too much medication. Then okay. you, you, know, you don't want to run into other you problems. Pop, but it can, pop an ulcer. Yeah. And, and it's good to ice if you tend to overdo some or okay. if you have one joint that's, that's bad. Say if you had an arthritic knee and that would act up after your exercise. And it's good to ice it afterwards. Okay. That helps cut down any inflammation. Um, are routine uh, steroid injections worthwhile in any particular circumstance? Well, I mean, it, it depends on what you're talking. Steroids, the anabolic steroids of the professional athletes are, I mean, that's, that's a huge problem in sports in general. And that's bad because there are a lot of, a lot of young people feel the pressure to, to start to take steroids in order mm -hmm. to... Um, uh, in order to compete at a higher level. However, the, the other type of steroids, the corticosteroids, which is the more common steroids that, that, that we deal with in, in the office, so that's an anti-inflammatory. It has nothing to do with the anabolic steroids. Perfect. We, we in, inject those into joints to try to calm them calm joints down. We try to stay away from it in the in the young um, athletes, but in the aging athletes, when they uh, if they get a flare up in a joint, then you can inject. What you don't want to be doing is injecting just to get out to play sports, and okay. um, and you don't want to be doing that on a um, on a regular basis. So you got to space them out. But every once in a while, someone with a, a very arthritic joint that's sore but still tries to stay active, then mm -hmm. we will inject it. So that would be something you would do short of, you know, doing a replacement type surgery. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, ideally, if you so can get by with bridge. an injection, yeah, it's more of a bridge. If you, that. right, right. If okay. you, if if you can get by with a cortisone injection or a steroid injection, then yeah, that's a lot safer than undergoing a joint replacement. Okay, perfect. Um, briefly, we didn't talk really much anything about the upper extremity, which I know you folks also deal with. Yep. Tell us a little bit about a rotator cuff. Well, the rotator cuff is, um, is a group of four small muscles uh, that coalesce and they form into a tendon at the top of the humerus, which is your upper arm bone. What the rotator cuff does, it, it stabilizes the top of the humerus so your, your, your bigger muscles, the, um, uh, the deltoid, can then work a little bit better. It will, uh, the deltoid is the workout horse of your of your shoulder, but the rotator cuff is essential in order to stabilize it. It's a very common problem because the rotator cuff runs right underneath the bone that's on the top, which is the, the acromion. So when okay. you raise your arm up, then actually you're pinching the rotator cuff. And so over time, then that can cause irritation. You can get tendonitis or mm -hmm. syn uh, syndrome we call impingement, where when you lift your arm up, it impinges onto the rotator cuff and it can get inflamed. So in, in people in their 30s and 40s, you see a lot of impingement syndrome. As they get older, then the rotator cuff can get thinner and a little bit weaker, and then you can get rotator cuff tears. Now, you can also get a rotator cuff tear um, as an athlete in, say, a direct blow, like, like right. uh, when a football player gets injured in the shoulder, they can tear the rotator cuff. But a lot of that we see are just um, things wearing down. Perfect. Uh, tonight we've had Dr. John Gibbons. He's our uh, board-certified orthopedic surgeon. Very, uh, very, very uh, erudite and expansive uh, explanation of uh, knee joint injuries. Uh, if you uh, need to talk to uh, John or any of his associates, uh, you can give them a jingle at the uh, phone number listed below. Uh, John, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming to the show tonight. And uh, he's a very approachable and an excellent surgeon. If you do have any questions, I'd be more than certain to be happy to talk to you over the phone or in person. Well, thank you, Gene. Thank you. I had a pleasure being here tonight. All righty, man. Hey, thanks. thanks for thanks for coming to the show. Okay. Uh, everybody have a safe, uh, enjoyable Thanksgiving holiday, uh, Christmas uh, season, and mm -hmm. uh, coming up soon, sparkle season, I guess we have to say, to be politically correct. Uh, if you want to stay out and stay away from this gentleman, be sure to buckle your seat belts, don't drink and drive, and uh, remain under the speed limit. Thanks to all the uh, students uh, for doing their uh, thing tonight. 
and also my uh, fine staff that you see rolling on the scroll there for all the background, which makes this show run very, very smoothly. Have a good holiday, and we'll see you next time. Yeah. Uh,